This is the last in the sequence of uh, lectures surveying interdisciplinary connections um, in the study of law. We, <coughs> we've laid out the basic project in the first week, noted the difference in methodologies between the social sciences and the humanities. Last week we looked at the social science disciplines most commonly encountered in law school curricula. And today I want to finish by looking at the three humanities disciplines, again, most commonly intersecting with uh, law school experience, and then leave you with um, a little bit better introduction, I hope, uh, than I gave the first week on um, the idea of systemic justice or systemic injustice, which I want to suggest is the next logical step, I think, in the progression from legal realism to law and society and on to uh, systemic injustice. And I, I want to challenge you in the end to begin to think systemically about justice and injustice. So that's that's the project for today. Uh, I'm going to start with history. Um, and all of this very superficial, unfortunately, by reason of time. But history will move into philosophy, moral as opposed to political philosophy. We'll finish with literature um, in the in this brief survey of the three humanities. Now. <coughs> history, <coughs> in some sense, is the most uh, difficult to stuff into the category of the humanities. Um, it is clear that history, to a very large extent, belongs methodologically in the social sciences. But it also has strong strains of and roots in the humanities. So I'm not going to worry too much about <coughs> the category I've just chosen to include it, include it in the humanities with the acknowledgement that uh, the social sciences have strong claims to the historian's work. Now, if you think about it, um, in, in any uh, of the English-speaking countries' legal systems, a sense of history is implicit. Um, in everything we do. What sense does it make to, to speak of common law, to speak of looking at precedent, looking at the past to decide what we do in the present? What sense would that make if we did not believe that history mattered? Uh, the, whole, the whole project is itself historical, of looking at past cases or long since written statutes and trying to apply them to the present. To the present. That is an, exa an example of historicity, okay, or the sense of the historical. The whole idea of common law couldn't exist without the belief that somehow the past gives us guidance for the present and into the future. The place I want to start, what I'm sort of skirting around, is what you might call historical consciousness, which, as I say, underlays the very notion of common law or looking at precedent uh, to decide the present. And the, the historian who's, I think, written the most illuminatingly, um, I, and I, I think brilliantly, um, on, his, on the concept of historical conscious, consciousness is this gentleman, now about to be 94 years old, John Lucas. Um, I forget, it, born behind the Eastern Bloc, but he's been living in the United States uh, most of his adult life. Um, 
fascinating character. I don't know, is anybody here studying history otherwise in connection with your law degree? Okay. Um, he, he's a really significant um, 20th century and early 21st century historian. Um, hard to pigeonhole politically. Um, just, a, just a remarkably creative thinker. Um, and his, probably his, his most well-known work explores the idea of historical consciousness. <clears throat> it's a form of thought, largely unsystematic, as he describes it, in which historicity or a sense of history pervades almost all areas of public thought and discussion. A remembered past. Uh, would be another way of describing historical consciousness. Um, a sense that one, you know, when he, when he says unsystematic, what he means by that is that everyday people, not intellectuals, not UL students, just everyday people, embody in their daily lives a sense of a remembered past. And you run into that, I run into that here all the time. You know, I don't get through a day um, here without hearing about 1922. Um, you know, there's a, a sense that pervades public life here or anywhere um, of this shared and remembered past. Lucas argues that this was not al always so that this actually is a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, he, he places it in the 1600s um, the, when historical consciousness began to arise. And clearly it would have had something to do as a practical matter with books becoming more widely available. That is a way to connect with people who lived in the past but could speak to us in the present through written word. Uh, it doesn't really matter when, when it arose, um, but the argument is that it pervades all of Western life at, at this point. <coughs> and if you, th if you carry that notion of historical consciousness back to, let's say, the, the great treatise writers in English law, Brockton, who's actually before that, but Hale, Blackstone, you know, Maitland, um, wh whoever have you, uh, or to the Irish legal scholar Darius Whelan today, or Daniel Binchy, um, who's a scholar of early Irish law. Um, these, these people are all themselves engaged in exploring the history of law, trying to synthesize or explain trends in that law and make it relevant to today. Now, legal historians specifically uh, can point to long-term trends and patterns that can be useful in understanding or appreciating law. For example, we met Richard Posner um, last week, you, and you've encountered him before in this course. Posner makes an essentially historical claim when he says that over time the common law tends toward economic efficiency. That is an historian's claim. It's not an economist's claim. He's describing an economic concept of efficiency, but he's making an historical claim about what the common law has done when we look at it over time. This gentleman, um, I picked a painting of him without his long beard, but this is Sir Henry Maine, 
uh, English legal scholar in the mid 19 mid 19th century, I should say, mid 1800s. He makes an historical claim um, in his famous book, Ancient Law, uh, from which the idea that many societies evolve over time legally from status to contract. And it's main signature idea. That's an historical claim. It's a synthesis of data points, historical data points, brought together in the historian's work uh, and formed into an argument that there's a coherence to the past and a, pre and a predictability of its trend lines into the future. A, an especially interesting American current legal historian is a guy named James Whitman um, at Yale, I believe. Uh, interesting for European um, law students and lawyers as much for American because what Whitman studies is why the United States has developed so differently than England and he, uh, he would argue most of the continent in the last two, three hundred years. Why do our criminal justice systems and mores look so different uh, given the common roots? Why are US prison sentences so long? Why is the United States still using capital punishment when all of Europe, England, Ireland, have abandoned capital punishment and have just strikingly different norms in criminal sentencing and the handling of crime. And this is Whitman's er area. Uh, again, looking for um, patterns that he can pick up. His, his, I think, very intriguing argument is that as class has become less acceptable in modern life, overt class status, you know, an aristocracy and uh, feudal serfs, you know, um, as class has become less overt, less rigid, less acceptable, it still exists, but we work very hard to deny class distinctions. As that has happened, to eliminate the overt class distinctions, Europe, including England and Ireland, by and large, have leveled up. That is, they have treated lower status people closer to uh, the treatment they historically afforded the elites, the aristocracy. They, they've sort of leveled up. So at a time in England, uh, for example, when um, the, the rich man would get benefit of clergy rather than uh, be hanged, while the poor man w would be hanged um, outside the prison gate, <coughs> as capital punishment withered in use and then eventually was abolished altogether, what you had was a leveling up. Just as the rich man didn't have the death penalty meted out very often in, say, 17th or 18th century England, now the poor man isn't subject to capital punishment either, just as one example. So he's, he's, he argues that Europe has leveled up, the United States has leveled down. That is, we, we degrade those of high class and treat them as if they are of low class, as the ways in which we sort of level out class distinctions. And I'll, I'll leave it at, <coughs> at that on the whole, um, but he makes a really very compelling argument. That that's exactly, for whatever reason, culturally, and he, and he says the cultural reasons are many and complex, but that that's what we do in the United States. 
is we tear, we tear down, we reduce those of high status to low status as a way of, you know, removing the appearance of class distinction in society. One has only to look at the prurient joy that Americans seem to get from seeing Lindsay Lohan in a jail jumpsuit, for example, to get a sense of that tendency in American life to want to degrade or knock off a pedestal uh, those who previously have had high status. I want to talk briefly now about the, the, some of the problems from perspective of studying law um, in history and in the way we write history or historiography, if you will, the writing of history. There are significant disagreements over what sources are legitimate. It's hard often to know what are the biases the goals, the choices of those who write history. They aren't disclosed in the way that social scientists typically disclose their assumptions or their biases, their operating conditions. And indeed, that this is a problem of bias in the writing of history that's been around for as long as we've been talking about history. You see it in Herodotus and Thucydides, ancient writers uh, well before the time of Christ, <coughs> who are considered together the fathers of history. Why? Because they made some effort at critical, objective storytelling, some effort at objective evidence gathering to support historical arguments, some effort not to write about a war purely from the victor's vantage point, for example, but rather to try to write objectively about the heroism of both winning and losing armies, for example. Beyond that, <clears throat> um, there are accidents in historiography, accidents in the presentation of history for which historians can't readily account and aren't always visible. An exa a good example of this would be William Blackstone. He has an outsized impact on American judges' ideas of what common law was, you know, of what historical in English law was. There's an outsized, I, you know, impact on that. Why? because he had an outsized impact on the men who framed the United States Constitution. Why was that? Because he just happened to be the current bestseller among legal treatise writers at the time the United States Constitution was being drawn up. Blackstone published his commentaries on the laws of England in 1769. That's just seven years before the American Declaration of Independence and 15 years or so before we're writing up the United States Constitution. So Blackstone was the available source for the American founders who were trying to draft a constitution and form a new nation. He wasn't necessarily the best source they could have used. He gets a lot wrong about English law, according to later commentators. But he had enormous influence on the American founders because he was the, he was the writer to whom they had access and from whom then they drew their ideas about what a written constitution ought to preserve in the way of individual freedoms. So purely accidental by timing and you then sort of bake in over the the centuries, the influence of one particular writer. 
Historians also have to be very careful about, the, about any prediction of the future um, and about making any sort of universal claims. Human history is not a cycle in any sort of simple sense, right? I mean, we like to say those who don't understand history are doomed to repeat it as if it, you know, it, it's a circular, cyclical function. History, of course, is not cyclical in any direct or simple way like that. Historians, careful historians, understand that the stories of the past are products of time, place, people, and context. That is, historical stories are entirely wrapped up in context in that way. People, places, things, time. And you can't then project reliably in a new day with new people in different places a lesson from the past. Oliver Cromwell, if he lived today, well, He'd have electronic surveillance available to him. He'd have nuclear weapons available to him, right? But he wouldn't have the same culture of religious faith in which to claim God's will. He wouldn't have the absence of public scrutiny through the media <coughs> or the same ability to practice terror in Ireland and Scotland without fear of foreign intervention. Exactly, exactly. That's just it. He, he just wouldn't have the same freedom to operate f without intervention in a different world with a different context at a different time. Okay? So, yes, it, it's valuable to study Cromwell and to think about how was it that he was able to do what he did, to rise to power as he did. That's valuable, that's important. But the historian can't, can't credibly say that it tells us how to deal exactly with the next Cromwell or the next President Xi of China or President Trump of the United States or you know, any of the other strongmen who are arising around the world as we sit here today. So historians really cannot predict future outcomes or specify desirable new policies. They can give us useful information and help us think intelligently about the past and how it might inform the future and our policy choices. They can help make us more intelligent, more informed. All right. Um, let's move on to philosophy, although it's called jurisprudence, the very course you're in as applied to law. Now, <coughs> you'll run into both moral and political philosophy on occasion in law school and in, and in jurisprudence, but I'm going to focus more on the moral uh, here, you know, for this very brief survey I'm giving you. Superficially, at least, the connection between philosophy and law, I think, remains the last great foothold of the humanities in the law school curriculum. I mean, m almost every law school continues to have jurisprudence offerings and to, to view the idea of jurisprudence as important. That said, it is also true that many English-speaking law students can get through three or four years of law school without ever taking jurisprudence, without really ever seriously encountering the philosophers who write about law. We can think of modern moral philosophy as it intersects with law in law school curricula. We can think of that as falling into essentially two groups, and I'm simplifying here obviously. But one, one would be contractarian philosophy, 
and the other would be non-contractarian philosophy. Now these sound like enormous words, and I, I get that. Um, by contractarian philosophy, I'm, I'm, I'm now going to distinguish two subsets of that, okay? There is the basic idea of social compact. John Locke, uh, Rousseau, um, that you've probably encountered in high school or here in college so far. The social compact that justifies government at all. So that's one area of contractarian, uh, very general moral and political philosophy. The other is heavily associated with this man, John Rawls. Um, Rawls <coughs> spent his life trying to elucidate a workable theory of justice. What is justice? What does it look like? How do we know when we've achieved it? How would we structure society to be just? Spent his entire lifetime working on that problem. And what he came up with is essentially a social contract model that is itself a thought experiment in its entirety. Okay? What, what Rawls said is if we, if we took contracting parties before they're even human, what he called behind the veil. If we, if we could be contracting parties before we knew what our human attributes would be, before we knew that we'd be born male or female, before we knew that we'd be born rich or poor, before we knew that we'd be born in Ireland as opposed to Azerbaijan. If, if we could if we can imagine contracting parties behind the veil, what sort of system, what society would they establish by agreement so that inequalities were as fairly distributed as possible? No contracting party knowing whether he or she eventually as an actual human being would be on the winning end or the losing end of these inequalities. It's this thought experiment of trying to figure out what contract would free, non-coerced parties acting in good faith strike <clears throat> before they knew what the advantages or disadvantages to them would be in the agreement, where they had to assume, in other words, that they would be the least advantaged member of society, where everybody had to assume that he or she would be the least advantaged member of the society. And that, for Rawls, was philosophically how you would get to then considering the kinds of rules that would make a society just. And he, he develops from that thought experiment the whole basic structure and details of a, of a liberal democratic society. And he's very clear that he's talking primarily to English-speaking people with traditions of the West. Democratic, small l, liberal traditions of the West. And he comes up with two principles <clears throat> by which he thinks a just society would distribute <coughs> excuse me, inequalities. First of all, any necessary inequalities would be attached to offices or positions to which all have equal access based on their merit. What does he mean by this? I can't hear you. 
Yeah, and but what 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 sort of office is he talking about that would have inequalities attached to it? Well, it might be a high government position that uh, allows one to wield enormous power, or it might be a job of high status that pays a great deal of money, more than the next job, okay? So there's an inequality of pay. What would justify the, the, the inequality, either in power or pay or whatever the advantage is to the office? Well, what would justify it is that it's open, just as you say, the pathway to that office is open to all equally based on their merit. So did they work hard at school? You know, did they get good grades? Have they achieved because of their merit? They would have access to that office. <coughs> it would not matter their sex. It would not matter their national origin. It would not matter whether they had blue eyes or brown. It would not matter whether they were six feet tall or five feet tall. The color of their skin wouldn't matter. None of that would matter according to his first principle of inequality. The inequalities would have to be attached to positions equally open to all on merit. And second, controversially for some, he posited that the least advantaged people in society must get the greatest benefit from inequalities. Now, that he recognizes is hard in the end to square with equal access. Because if the least advantaged in society have to get the greatest benefit of inequalities, then aren't you really talking about a principle that overrides pure merit and looks at the disadvantages under which you operate and grants you the greater benefit of the inequality because of those very disadvantages? <coughs> Excuse me. Rawls recognized the tension in that. And although Theory of Justice came out in 1971, uh, it took him another 30 years to try to develop a philosophically sound system for addressing some of these tensions. And uh, he, he tried just the year before his death in 2001 um, with a rewrite of a theory of justice called Justice is Fairness. Either one of these books are really, I think, essential reading um, for Irish law students, American law students, any English-speaking law students. Um, Rawls is really um, an extraordinary um, thinker who sort of stands alone. <coughs> All right, so that's, that's the contractarian. We'll move to the non-contractarian, and I'm just going to use Ronald Dworkin as one example of a non-contractarian moral philosopher who wrote in and thought almost exclusively about law. Law is empire, taking rights seriously, the philosophy of law, he wrote any number of books. And for Dworkin and others like him, law is an inescapably moral question. You simply can't take morality out of law. He said, a conception of law, and I'm quoting him here, a conception of law must explain how, it, how what it takes to be law provides a general justification for the exercise of coercive power by the state. You just, you, you can't get around morality. Uh, and and he, he, he really takes on the legal realists and the positivists in this sense. And positivists 
say, no, the law is whatever the legislature says it is. Well, that's in itself uh, invariably a moral judgment for uh, Dworkin. And what the legislature says may be bad law or unworthy of being considered law if it does not meet the justification for the course of exercise of government power in the first place. So for Dworkin, the goal of law was integrity, as he called it. And he, I won't go into this in any depth, but he used integrity in a very you know, specific sense. Coherence, adhesion to fundamental principle, justification, again, that is why, why is it fair for the state to exercise course of power, and fidelity to political morality. Probably the most, I think, practical um, work that Dworkin did for lawyers, um, especially, and judges, is he attacked and, to my mind, destroyed the sort of phony idea that what judges do is simply find law as opposed to making law. <clears throat> This distinction between finding and making law, uh, Dworkin said, was sheer, utter nonsense. And yet it pervades our political discussion uh, <coughs> about judging to this day. We've not gotten past it. We haven't listened to Dworkin. To Dworkin, judges are both finding and making law. They are bound by fidelity to the past, fidelity to the legitimizing qualities of law, that is, that allow it to operate coercively. But then they confront a range of options in outcomes. And they have to pick the one with the best integrity, the best coherence of fit to the culture and to the fairness of the outcome in the case. Law is, in other words, judging is, in other words, an exercise in constructive interpretation. All right. So basic problems um, with philosophy as applied to law, things to be aware of um, in considering just how much help philosophy can give us in understanding law. First of all, especially in this area of moral philosophy, you run into basic definitional disagreements all the time. These writers don't use the common meaning of many of the terms they pick, <coughs> like integrity, and they don't agree one with the other on what the meaning of some of these words should be. So you are, you're, you're constantly unable to compare one to another because each is using his or her own vocabulary and specialized system of meaning. And the practical d application is often difficult beyond that, because philosophers necessarily consider broad concepts and ideals um, in conditions, in human actors. <coughs> they don't deal with the nitty gritty, the specific, all that well. Take, for example, uh, Dworkin has uh, kind of a nice, um, uh, tool uh, that he creates, um, which he calls Judge Hercules. He imagines a hypothetical judge, Hercules, and says, all right, how does Hercules decide cases? 
and, and works through the philosoph philosophical problems of judging through his imaginary Judge Hercules. All right, well, that's great. And it really is great in the sense of helping us think through what ought judges be trying to do. What are they doing when they're doing their best? But <coughs> Hercules is a judge of unlimited wisdom, unlimited time, unlimited help from lawyers, law clerks, no docket pressure, no sense of caseload, overload. He doesn't have real world problems. He's got all the time he needs to sit in chambers, gaze at the ceiling, and then write uh, or reason out his decisions. He's not a judge working in the real world of the Limerick District Court, who's got 15 cases to hear this morning and another 15 cases this afternoon on her docket. Okay, um, so they're just. These are the, the obvious sort of limitations. The philosopher uh, can give us a theoretical framework. The difficulty of, often is in the application. All right, um, on to literature. Literature is the one I think that law students have the hardest time seeing what the connections to law might be. What in the world does law have to do with literature? Well, smart people have argued just about everything, actually. Um, there are two senses in which law and literature intersect. First of all, maybe most simply, there is law in literature, okay? I mean, uh, a good deal of literature addresses law as part of the cultural context for its story. Take this gentleman, the late great Irish Supreme Court Justice. Anybody ever get to meet him or, no? He died young and recently. Um, brilliant man and a James Joyce enthusiast, uh, an amateur James Joyce enthusiast <coughs> when he wasn't sitting on the Irish Supreme Court. He wrote a, gr a terrific book called Joyce in Court. It came out posthumously, so it just came out a few months after his death. Um, and, he was, and I'll warn you, he wasn't quite done writing it. So his editor had to assemble the last bits of it from notes, rough drafts that Hardiman left when he died suddenly, okay? It's nonetheless a fabulous book. And it simply explores the role that law plays in James Joyce's world, in Ulysses, in Finnegan's Wake. Most of the book fo focuses on Ulysses. But it, it is such a wonderfully accessible <laughs> book. Um, and a subtext of it is that most of the people who write about Joyce are, are full of shit. You know, that they, 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 they write impenetrably and with sort of a deliberate befogging uh, of the issues with their language, abstruse discussions. He writes with such beautiful, simple clarity about Joyce um, and his difficult work um, that it, it's, it's this, this book is really just a joy uh, to read. And that's an example of law in literature. All right, what did James Joyce have to say about law? What legal issues did Leopold Bloom you know, encounter on that day in June 1904? Um, and there, there's a remarkable amount woven into a book like Ulysses of earlier Irish cases, cases that were then pending, uh, legal disputes of the time, <coughs> divorce, and how that worked 
uh, in turn of the century, Ireland, you know, on and on. So Hardiman's a good example of one way in which law and literature connect, which is just law in literature. Other good examples, Bleak House by Charles Dickens. You know, a send-up and satire devastating of the English legal uh, system of the day. Um, uh, so, you know, this binary connection between literature and law, um, law in literature really I think is most helpful in allowing us to think about the ways in which law shapes and is shaped by popular culture and thus appears in literature. And also literature uh, to the extent it writes about or captures law of its day can, can turn out to be a useful historical record in its own way. There's a deeper though way in which law and literature connect and that's <coughs> uh, that's in the argument that law is a deeply literary activity in itself. That what judges and lawyers do is literary in a deep way. So why? All right. Well, look. Lawyers are creatures of words, of language. We use words entirely. We sell words to the extent we're a solicitor or a barrister. The written word, the spoken word. These are our tools of the trade. Writers the same. Using language, writers explore truths of human existence, the meaning of life, right and wrong, any topic you might imagine. That's what writers do. And judges, at least, and lawyers of necessity do that too. We use words to address the ordinary conflicts of human life that wend their way into courts, or at least might, because people come into conflict. And this more complex relationship really is at the core of the law and literature school, or movement, which arose in the early 70s at about the same time as law and economics, and as a response, bluntly speaking, to law and economics. Ronald Dworkin, the philosopher we just met, <coughs> gives us an example of this deeper connection uh, between law and literature, law as a literary activity. Dworkin makes uh, the analogy, uses, or uses the metaphor, I guess, of judging as akin to writing what he calls a chain novel. What he means by that is that a judge who has to make a decision, Judge, Hercu judge Hercules, is in effect handed a series of chapters written by other judges before her. And now she must write a chapter that has fidelity to all of the chapters that have gone before and that will point the way for the judge after her to write the next chapter in this chain novel written over hundreds of years by successive writers who will never meet one another often but who together compose the story of law in a particular society one chapter at a time. That metaphor is, is, is richly literary, I mean, and overtly literary. This is the leading thinker in, in this 
law and literature area. James Boyd White, um, now and for most of his career, as it turns out, at the University of Michigan. He's really got the best claim to, to sort of founding the law and literature movement. And he has a number, makes a number of points, almost all of which will be familiar to you if, you're, if, you're, if you know literary criticism, if you have any interest in literary criticism. <coughs> One, language is never neutral or transparent. It's intertwined with the mind of the writer, with her ideas, with her sentiments. Two, language creates a community between writer and reader, speaker and listener. What does that mean? What it means is that everyone who writes anything has in mind an audience, a reader, and wants what he or she writes to have a certain intellectual and emotional impact on that reader. Take something as simple as a thank you note that you might scratch out on one little piece of note paper. You're writing it for a specific person. You want that person to read it and to feel as if they've been valued by you. You might want that person to have a certain emotional reaction to the praise or the thanks you're giving. Maybe it should be lighthearted because it was a festive holiday occasion. Maybe it should be very somber because this is a person who consoled you in a time of personal grief. Whatever it is, you are trying to evoke an emotional response from your reader and trying to have the reader think something of you. You're presenting yourself in a certain way to the reader with something as simple as a four or five line note of thanks. This community you're creating Im involves the writer imagining what literary critics call the ideal reader. This is a term that James Boyd White uses too. The ideal reader. Every writer, whether she knows it or not, whether she's conscious of it at the time, is imagining an ideal reader. Someone who's really pleased to get the thank you note rather than will just open the envelope and say, oh, Sally wrote me a thank you note and pitch it. Someone who will read the words take them in, think of the writer as the writer wishes to be thought of, and participate in the emotional reaction that the writer hoped or intended. <coughs> That's the ideal reader. If you write something longer than a thank you note, when you get into writing legal arguments, you will have in mind an ideal reader. Who is the judge I want to read this? What do I want to invoke in him? How do I want him to respond to the argument? Do I want him to be angry? Do I want him to be swept up in the justice of my client's cause? Do I want the argument to be poignant, to be scholarly? to be simple and breezy. What do I want? What ideal reader do I have in mind? We're doing this all the time, anytime we write anything. We are projecting who will read it, what their response will be, and, and, and we're doing that in an idealized way. We don't like the thought 
the, the reader might read the first paragraph and then just pitch the next 10 pages aside or scoff at it or whatever. And because language creates a community between writer and reader, speaker and listener, it's in a sense constitutive. It puts together a community, maybe a community of two. Or if it's Charles Dickens and Bleak House, it's a community of tens of millions over centuries who have read that book and had Dickens speak to them. And this idea then that language itself constitutes, helps create community between writer and reader, listener and speaker, gets at what Wittgenstein, the crazy philosopher, um, meant when he said to imagine a language means to imagine a form of life. To imagine a language means to imagine an entire form of life. And White takes these concepts and then explores what good judging would be. Looks at judicial texts and says, okay, what sort of ideal reader does that text imagine? did that judge have in mind? Someone who simply wants to be passively told the answer to the case? Someone who's going to accept fiat or judicial dictate and simply obey unthinkingly? Or does the judge, through her opinion, appear to imagine a thinking, sensitive reader who wants to be persuaded of the correctness of the outcome, who cares about whether the outcome is just, who will read the opinion critically. Who's the ideal reader that this judicial text appears to imagine? And White gives good examples from all ends of the spectrum I just described. <coughs> Judicial writing itself keeps old texts alive for White, gives them current meaning. What does Article 8 of the Irish Constitution mean? It was written whenever it was written, but it has to be applied today. What does it mean for our lives today? That's a form of translation to use the literary critic's term, or White's term. We're translating the old text into present meaning. And excellence in judging, then, is simply excellence in translation and excellence in the ideal reader that the text creates. Now, I want to acknowledge sort of a third branch of law and literature, um, altogether different than James Boyd White. Have you, you, you've run in, or you will later in this semester, run into critical legal studies, critical race theory, critical feminist theory? Hello? Okay? All critical theory stems from the connection between law and literature. Why? Because it's rooted, critical theory is rooted in deconstruction. Jacques Derrida. Literary criticism and the idea of deconstructing language. All critical theory stems from that. Critical legal theory as we use it and have for the last 40 years or so. And what 
what the critical legal theories share in common is that they are a critique of law as reflecting current power structures. I guess I'd put it that way. I mean, at a, at a general level. All of them share that. They are a critique of law and a development or an exploration of how and why law reflects whatever the current power dynamics and structure of a society are. That is, law tends to favor those with power. Is, is the you know the essence of the critical legal theorist's argument. All right. Difficulties with law and literature. Uh, much the same practical difficulties that you encounter with moral philosophy. <coughs> tends to be theoretical, tends to be idealized. Uh, most of real life falls short uh, by quite a margin to that. And very little of law, as most people actually experience it, involves written or even oral communication beyond the rudimentary. Think about that. The actual legal problems that you and your clients have, or the ways in which you encounter law, normally does not have well-developed writing or speaking. You may go your entire life as a citizen and never have a court case that results in a written opinion. Instead, your encounters with law as a citizen tend to be encounters in which the only words are no parking or no smoking. Shoplifters will be prosecuted. Fill out this form and return it to the desk. <coughs> Very rudimentary uses of language, actually, uh, inform almost all of the day-to-day -day legal encounters that people have. And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say that law and literature tells us much about that real-world application. All right. I'm running out of gas pretty soon. Um, but I, did, I do want to leave you with um, an introduction or a deeper introduction to the idea of systemic injustice. This is what's beyond law and society, I think, in your lifetimes. Systemic justice is, is a term that, um, to take us all the way back to the beginning of these three lectures, where I started with the, the dean of the Harvard Law School, Christopher Columbus Langdell. The idea of systemic injustice, or that term, not the idea, but the term has originated at Harvard Law School in recent years. And it captures an especially rich interdisciplinary ganglia, you know, meeting of disciplines with law. Many of the people in these disciplines are not themselves even yet using the term systemic injustice, but they're writing about it, they're thinking about it. And the, the way I want you to start thinking about it is um, what I'll call the cascade, which, by which I mean the connectedness of human problems, poverty, class, gender, sexual orientation, family status, whatever it might be, and how the problems one encounters get connected to one to another through this matrix. So by cascade, what I mean is many of our clients experience law 
as a cascade of problems that connect to and build on one another and that can become utterly devastating in the end. Let me try to give you an example of this, which I'm drawing from a wonderful book by a Harvard ethnologist named Matthew Desmond. It came out a couple years ago. Say we've got a mother of two young boys, 13 and 5. She lost her rental home because the city declared it unfit for human habitation. So she has to move out with the boys. The city boarded this up, find her landlord, and now the landlord won't improve the property, so she's got to go. After a series of stays with acquaintances, all fail because of conflict with those acquaintances, too many people living in one room or two rooms at one time, or the acquaintances themselves being evicted, she ends up in a domestic violence shelter. <coughs> She's lost three of her five children already to Child Protective Services. Why? Because she couldn't afford to go repeatedly to court to contest the right to remain in custody of the children. Her friend now offers her a temporary place to stay, but then secretly calls Child Protective Services to get the social worker to force the woman and her children out when she's overstayed her welcome. That puts at risk the mother's relation with the two remaining boys over whom she does have custody because now Child Protective Services is enmeshed in her life again. The social worker forces her out of this latest living arrangement. She fills out 89 applications for new places to rent, eventually gets a nice apartment on the 90th application. She's turned down that many times before because most landlords reject those who've been evicted in the prior three years. The rent is higher for this nice apartment than it would be in the suburbs where wealthier people live because she lives in a city where very few people can own homes and thus all the demand is to rent and the rents rise. The apartment building, though, comes to be designated a nuisance property because there's a local ordinance that says if the police have had to visit the built, any one building X number of times in six months for domestic calls or whatever it might be, that this is a nuisance property. So any further police visits will cause the landlord to evict the person responsible for the visit because the landlord doesn't want the nuisance property designation. The mom has to make an emergency call for an ambulance when the 13-year-old boy has an asthma attack. That counts as a police contact with the property, even though it's a medical emergency. And that results in her eviction again. Because of these constant moves, that same 13-year-old boy had attended five schools during the year he was 12 and 13. So he's way behind because of the disruption in his education. He's way behind in learning. Meanwhile, with all the moves, there's been a foul up in her food stamps, in the change of address, so that her food stamps will follow her. So she's not getting her food stamps. Then the 
boy, the 13-year-old, the older son, begins to act out in school because he's doing poorly and his social relationships are disrupted by the constant moves to new school. He acts out, snaps at a teacher, runs out of school, and now there's a truancy proceeding against the 13-year-old boy and a school suspension proceeding against the 13-year-old boy. So there's both a court process for mom to try to participate in on behalf of her son and a school administrative process involving his suspension. And the ensuing police visit because of the truancy is the last straw for the landlord <coughs> who evicts her yet again to avoid the nuisance property status. So she's homeless again with the two boys and has at least two legal proceedings with which to try to contend in all her spare time between working and raising two children alone. That's an example of the cascade of problems. Now, all of them have a legal aspect. Ordinances about habitability of homes. Ordinances about nuisance properties. About the number of people who can be living in X square meters. School suspension proceedings will have a process by which one goes through. Truancy proceedings will have a process. Child protective services, child custody proceedings are judicial. But very few of them, very few of these legal processes actually involve going to court or having access to a lawyer. One doesn't hire a lawyer if one's living on the precipice of poverty to try to get your food stamps reinstated <coughs> or to get an arrearage in the food stamps. That's a nice idea to hire a lawyer to deal with your food stamp problem, but you don't have the money to do that. So you're trying to negotiate these legal systems, school administrative, public benefits, landlord tenant, whatever it might be, child custody. Many people are trying to work their way through these essentially on their own. And the problems don't sort themselves neatly into the categories that we impose on a legal curriculum. They aren't just administrative law, or just property, or just contract, or just criminal law. They cut across, as a practical matter, these silos that, by which we teach people their legal education. And it's the, the project of systemic thinking about justice and injustice to try to address that cascade of problems, both for a client and more broadly. That is, how do we avoid or reduce the number of people who find themselves buried under this cascade of what seem like fairly trivial legal problems, but <coughs> that pile up and can diminish significantly one's life prospects. So that's, that's I guess where I would start in trying to explain and get you thinking about systemic justice. Um, when you go out and practice, if you go out and practice, especially if you're dealing with people who are impoverished, in any number of ways. You will encounter this all the time. 
the ways in which cross-cutting legal systems ensnare people and ultimately defeat them. Leave them simply tied up in legal processes that they cannot navigate themselves and don't have the money to pay a lawyer to navigate. The academic work that falls under this umbrella that I'm, I and, and as I say now several at Harvard Law School are calling systemic injust injustice is very broad. You have historians working in this area. Howard Zinn, uh, Roxanne dunbar Ortiz, um, Edward Baptist. You've got all kinds of sociologists, lots of sociologists, criminologists. Uh, Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow is a significant work that I think falls in the area of systemic injustice. Um, public health professionals are thinking systemically now. Critical legal theorists, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, for example, is a critical race theorist. Duncan Kennedy, Sabil Rahman, Francisco Valdez, Jennifer Hill, historians of science, other law professors. Um, there are a couple of people at the University of Sydney Law School down in Australia who are working explicitly in the area of systemic injustice. Documentary filmmakers, um, a whole range of disciplines are engaged in, or people within these disciplines are engaged in systemic thinking about the ways in which problems overlap and cascade upon people, typically because they are disadvantaged. It would be tempting to think about systemic injustice um, hopelessly, you know, in a postmodern kind of way, um, that justice is impossible, that it will never happen for the poor. And that's not necessarily the right way to think about it. I hope it's not the way you would think about it in your early 20s in law school. Why are you here? Why are you here if not to try to advance the project of justice in some way, in some place, for some people? It's not impossible. Indeed, I think beginning to think systemically about these problems gives you the purchase to then think about how do we address them? How do we begin to solve them? How does the one relate to the other in ways that lawyers weren't thinking about <coughs> 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago? And how do we meet the challenges that real people face in an increasingly complex legal environment and in ways that does not leave the disadvantaged permanently in that state? I don't think justice, or at least advancing toward it, is impossible. And you shouldn't take the idea of systemic injustice as a claim of hopelessness. I hope you take it instead as a challenge to try to address in the next 50 years as you practice law the ways in which the world predictably remains unjust for most people in it. And to draw, try to do what little bit you can about it. You'll have lived a good life and led a good career if you do that, at least occasionally. Um, and I think, you know, I think you'll value trying to do that um, if you do. That's all I've got. I'm done. Thank you for 
joining me in the last three weeks. This has been a real honor. I appreciate it.